So good morning, everybody. Um, glad to be here. Uh, glad to see so many faces. I was here two years ago, and uh, they invited me back to see if we could top the attendance record. We'll have to come and see if we actually did it. How many of you heard the music when you came in? Did it, did it make you nice and relaxed? <laughs> you move kind of slow anyway this morning, right? That's good. I wanted to relax you a little bit because the topic that I'm going to talk about this morning is anything but relaxing. It's terrifying. So uh, hopefully you'll walk out of the room scared. That's my goal. Um, the topic actually is uh, called OCD deployment, and I'm going to talk a lot about what you do when it comes time to uh, launch something that you've worked really hard on for a very long time and, and actually send it out into the world. Um, and I'm going to use some examples from platform.sh. Uh, the examples are on the current product that I'm working on with Commerce Dice, but the uh, know-how and the philosophy that I'm going to present to you has been developing over the past six years, uh, including the time that I spent on the Acquia Cloud team. So uh, it's, uh, the examples are from platform, but the topics are quite wide ranging and not specific to any one tool. So when you've worked really hard to build something, and it's time to get it out into the world, you really want to have a little bit of confidence that you know what you're doing and you have a bit of practice. Because otherwise it can go horribly, horribly, horribly wrong. And uh, how many of you have ever had a, a, a site launch that felt a little bit like that in the more metaphorical sense, right? Okay, good. And I'm, I've got the right audience. And I don't need to horrify you. You've already seen into hell. You've been there. You know what it feels like, that gripping, sinking feeling where you wish you could just revert your life to a different branch. <laughs> so, as I'm going through this philosophy of OCD deployment, you need to know what I mean when I say a web application. When I say a web application, I'm very, very specifically talking about some code. Can anybody name that module? Anybody? Okay, you don't, you don't read core often enough, people. Um, I'm talking about code. I'm talking about infrastructure. Okay, it's on the server room of Commerce Guys. Just kidding, really. Uh, and I'm talking about data, okay? And when I talk about data, I'll get into this more later, but I'm not just talking about a database, but I'm also talking about anything that goes onto a persistent disk, such as uploaded files or a solar index or even a cache that's been um, marshaled into files. And I'm talking about the three of these things together as an integral unit. And if you ever deploy a web application, that doesn't have the code, the infrastructure, and the data in one exactly known state that is known to work all three of those units together, then what you've done is something akin to the video that I just showed you. You've launched an unholy mess, okay? So when I talk about a web application, I'm very clearly talking about a known state of code, infrastructure, and data that have to be married together at a, at a very high level, okay? Um, now, when I talk about deployment, I'm not just talking about that moment when you launch the ship out into the world. That's probably the most important deployment that you do because it's the one where it's, you know, your client will fire you if you screw up like the video did. Uh, and it's the one that people see and you know, real money's on the line in terms of you know, the site that you're launching. But actually, deployment happens every time a developer sets up their local develop environment. A deployment happens every time you need to show a customer a specific feature that you're working on. Every time you're on an automatic test, there's deployment that happens there. And if you've launched your site and you roll out a new feature, that's also a deployment. If you've launched your site and you need to change the size of the infrastructure, that's also a deployment. So when I'm talking about the OCD deployment of web applications, we're talking about the many, many, many times in the life cycle of any website when you do that deployment of code, infrastructure, and data over different environments. So here's a typical workflow that we're all conceptually familiar with, you know, the local dev stage prod workflow, but in actual reality, for 
people who run companies that have more than one person in them, which is a lot of people in the room, deployment actually is more like this, because for every single developer you have, you have a local environment. For every single feature branch that you're working on, you have a deployment. You have a merging deployment as they go into the sprint branch. You have a, another deployment as it goes into continuous testing, another deployment when it goes to UAT or staging, and then finally, you get to put the ship on the crane and put the ship in the water when it goes onto the live site. So, as you can see, this is a topic that has a complexity that's driven by numbers. The more people working on it, the more features, the more complex your deployment. Okay, now, are there actually real-world problems? Are actual Drupal ships falling off of piers into uh, bays with the crane? Yes, if you search around for um, the typical sites for uh, questions and answers about Drupal deployment problems, you see things like, oh, how do I migrate from test environment to production environment? And then there's a huge long thread of 20 different strategies and all the problems that can happen. Um, or what happens if I've got broken image links after I've moved my Drupal site from one machine to a live server? It's broken, how do I fix that? So these are very common problems. The home page is missing a theme in CSS after migrating to a VPS. The updating from, to PHP 4 breaks uh, Drupal 7.5, What version of PHP are we on now? It's like 4, that's old stuff, right? So you know, these are problems that people are actually having uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's, you know, it's part of the cost of doing Drupal development, however much we like that fact or not. Dealing with solar indexes on development in live environments. Uh, how do I deal with the fact that um, on dev stage and prod, you know, if, if I move my stuff, I need to index the solar uh, every time. So who uses solar, who does passive driven navigation? You know, have you ever built a web shop where, if, you know, you get new uh, high heel pumps in, into stock, it shows up as a menu item because they're in stock because of passive driven navigation? You need to index your solar uh, data before you can actually see that happen, and you have to do that on every environment. So these are interesting problems to deal with. And if you don't do it right, if you don't really think about what you're doing, you can actually find yourself in some, well, professionally speaking, rather touchy situations. <laughs> so again, that sinking feeling when you've done something that wasn't quite right, and now, Everything that has gone wrong is online for the customer to see, and you've got to fix it, and you don't know quite where to start. So let's talk about how to fix that. OCD stands for orchestrated, consistent, and deterministic. And I'm going to present to you today my framework for evaluating deployment technologies and practices where you can measure, at least in this way, how good it actually is and how much it's going to protect you from those horror scenarios that I just painted. Because remember, I want you to be afraid. If you're not afraid, then um, you, you haven't actually deployed enough real life sites in your life because you would be afraid by nature if you had. So orchestrated, consistent, and deterministic. Let's go into what that means, one by one. Orchestrated. Orchestrated means planned to produce a desired effect. So in terms of an orchestration, you need to plan, or your uh, deployment, you need to plan it in advance so that the desired effect is exactly what you get, and not some undesired effect like debris flying at your head at 100 miles an hour. What does that mean in real Drupal life? So that means uh, when you orchestrate something, uh, what we usually mean is we mean <coughs> provisions and servers. Okay, everybody knows that. Your site needs some servers. Whether your server is your local laptop, or a development server that's under the desk of the CTO, or something in the cloud, you need servers. You also need storage, because uh, remember my web application concept includes the data that goes to persistent disk. And you also need a whole bunch of networking things so that people who want to see your website can call it on the network, there's an address and the URL that resolves to it, and they eventually get back the website after all of the different servers in the back end of exchange data between each other, and the web services and analytics and everything. So you need network IO. And that needs to be set up every time that you deploy. And on those servers, you need a number of running services. This is a growing number for the more complex Drupal sites. Um, it used to be just PHP and MySQL, but then we 
became fond of things like Memcache and Redis. We became fond of things like Solar, Elasticsearch, and now we see a lot more things like uh, Node.js and MongoDB playing a role in your Drupal sites as well. Not to mention if you've got transactional workflow-based sites, maybe a RabbitMQ or some other queuing mechanism, and the list goes on and on. <coughs> then after you've got those nice things, part of the orchestration is to get the code and the data onto that persistent storage into the right running services. And after you've done all that, you need to monitor it, you need to maintain it, patches, and you need to change that orchestration and that deployment if the, uh, if the underlying versions of the software need to change, such as if you need to upgrade your Debian distribution or uh, bring out a new feature of Solar for a, a new version of Solar for a good feature that you've got. Right, so as I mentioned, a, a, a Drupal site these days has so many components in it, and if you want it to be highly available, then that adds an extra challenge that you have to have redundant copies of everything, and if you have read the CAP theorem and you know about consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, and you know that you can't just have two copies of anything, you need three copies of everything, uh, then we're talking about you know a lot of copies of a lot of services after we go through HA proxy, proxy Nginx, PHP FM, MariaDB or PostgreSQL, Solar, Elasticsearch, Redis, or Memcache, oh my god, right? It's like, I just want to write some code and you know, get going here. So I've got this great idea for a site. Why can't I just write the site? Well, this is the way modern sites are done. Or at least in Drupal world, uh, these are very often the services that you see. So to really have a production deployment and guarantee the high availability for all services, uh, you also have to have a disaster recovery plan. It means you've got to have backups and a way to get the backup back into your deployment if that's um, failed. Uh, you need to be able to guarantee that you can roll up patches to every layer, all of those services, um, when the security things happen. And for every developer and tester, as well in production, they need to have access to a version of that. So this is why I'm saying you should be terrified. Because this is terrifying and difficult in its complexity. And if you don't actually have an OCD deployment at every step of the way, then the mistakes that you saw in the video where you uh, you know, you crash your ship, they'll happen at some point, and it will cost you money and or reputation. Um, the list of requirements goes on. You know, those services they need to be able to graceful shut down and restart. Um, you need to be able to reroute network access if uh, it goes away. Um, the control levels, the ACLs, the permission levels, uh, need to be very carefully monitored. And you should probably have a central key management for those servers so that only the right people in the right circumstances can access any service um, for all sorts of security reasons. And uh, like I said, monitoring. Um, okay. Huge list of requirements, right? This is all under the orchestration part. When your orchestration and your deployment happens, you have to think about all those things. Now, granted, it's a little easier on your local laptop. The only thing you really have to worry about on there is somebody stealing the laptop and then having access to everything on it. But it's not likely to come under consistent attack from um, you know, hackers um, online all the time. So it's a little easier to deploy to your laptop, but it's also critical that you do it the same way uh, when you're doing local development, because that's the only way that you know when you push it up to something else online that you're going to have a consistent um, uh, experience. So I, I won't talk so much about the persistent storage. Um, I, I think I'm doing a good enough job scaring you all that I'm actually putting you to sleep with uh, the requirements of a consistent orchestra or a, a big orchestration. But I will mention that the hardest part out of everything that I've mentioned so far, in my opinion, is actually getting the persistent storage right. So where your database goes, where your uploaded files go. When you're launching a site, this is easily, for me, the hardest part to solve, especially when you want to um, talk about scalability and high availability, um, particularly, as you'll see later in the presentation, in light of making sure that your other environments, other than production, have actual copies of the data that you want to test with and develop with. Um, so you need to make sure for production that there's no single point of failure around the storage. That means you're probably going to be using something like either um, a highly available um, NFS mount, or a cluster FS, or a Ceph, or some other distributed file system, the likes of which, you know, computer, computer science majors study, but like the normal group of developer gets a little bit, you know, shaky in the knees when they have to think about it, because it's, it's, not, it's not at the same level that 
you know, it's, it's a totally different level of infrastructure than what people want to be doing when they are building web, web, web applications. You know, I don't want to have to think about that if I'm writing a module, but yet a consistent orchestrated deployment of my application is going to require these things. Right. Um, and you have to read the WP patch list or you can't keep up with the security. So, that's the scary part. The goal, however, with this orchestration is that you want to do something, however you get there, whether it's with a tool like Puppet or Ansible or Chef or this example, uh, which is from platform.sh, you want to have all of that in a way that it's comprehensible to the developers and the architects who are making real decisions about your site. So let's say you're browsing Google.org and you see that chat room feature that requires a node surf. Okay? That's great. Your client wants it, you want to build it, it's exciting, it's modern, it's very nice. When you want that to be on your site, do you want to have to think about all those things that I just talked about? Or do you want to be able to write in a file like this, Node.js? Deploy that and it gets done for you. Um, now, there are lots of ways to achieve this, and um, some of them are actually OCD and some of them aren't. Um, but in terms of orchestrating with all of those requirements that I just mentioned, the ultimate ideal is to be able to write something like orchestrate MySQL for me, orchestrate Node for me, and it's just there. When you're done, if you've written that into a specific file or turned it on with a switch in your admin panel or all your system in and set it, however you get it done, you just want it to be there. You don't want to have to think about that uh, huge checklist of requirements that I just gave you. So this is the aspirational goal for orchestration in an OCD deployment. It's just to be able to declaratively describe what you need for your application to run in terms of orchestration. And then it's going to be there, not just in production, but on every environment that you work in across the entire workflow, starting with local, through all your feature branches, through your sprint branch, your testing branch, UAT, stage, and finally in production. Uh, and there's more stuff that goes into that. Um, you know, you can't just say, give me MySQL. Um, usually you have to say some other things about your application when you deploy it, like what kind of mount points it has, what kind of cron tabs it has, uh, whether or not it should be behind HTTP access at the moment, uh, whether or not the mail module is turned on, so you're not, you know, sending mails to your development um, on your development site to your customers accidentally. Um, ideally, you can describe all of those requirements in one way, and that will be transported through all of your deployments in such a way that the application builds itself according to the requirements of the deployment for whatever environment it's on. And there are a lot of people who are working on various versions of this, and we'll talk about some of them. Okay, so that was O, OCD, orchestrated. The next um, word in the um, acronym is consistent, and that, of course, in English means acting or done in the same way over time. Acting or done in the same way over time. Okay, so when that comes to deployment, what does that mean? That means for every deployment that you make across your entire life cycle of application deployment, you want to be able to use the same methodology for deploying on every step of the way. And if I look around the web and I see things like Open um, Stack, Open Shift, um, what Azure is doing, uh, what GitHub and Bitbucket are doing, it's consolidating, and the <coughs> deployment methodology of choice can be summoned down, uh, boiled down to Git push. So, uh, if you can consistently deploy to all of your environments across your entire lifecycle and workflow with these two words, then you're getting to the level of consistency that I envision when I talk about an OCD deployment. That's the aspirational goal. It's not always possible, but um, I'll show you how far you can get with some of the tools available in, in a bit. So when you do a consistent uh, deployment, then you use uh, the same tools. Um, you know that when you deploy from local to dev to test to stage that, the, um, that it will work because every time you do it, it's a 
practice run of the final deployment. It's like how, how great would it have been for those shipbuilders if they had had like a row of seven different ships and they could have tested with seven different cranes, you know, how it works. Oh, look at that one that, you know, the crane fell over. I guess we have to change a couple things about, you know, you know, the, the weight properties of screwing down the crane a little bit better. Let's try it and we get six more ships, no problem. We can actually do that with code because uh, deployment is actually cheap until it comes to production and it's, you know, then it really counts. But you want it to be the same every time. You want to know that the practice that you get when you put your application onto the development server, that actually goes towards giving you and your customer confidence that your live deployment will actually work. Um, if it's a different deployment routine for every environment, then you're not doing yourself any favors because you're not getting that practice, you're not building confidence along the way, maybe 20, 30 times in the, in the course of a sprint. You're not getting that confidence that your uh, actual deployment is going to go well. And you also want, and this is hopefully obvious, you want the same infrastructure and data to be uh, available to you every step of the way. So if you break that down into a, a tool set, then, of course, I've already mentioned Git for managing the code. And that's where it should all start. That should be like the trigger, um, either Git or maybe um, a, another tool like, um, uh, say I've got Puppet, Chef, Ansible, SaltStack. Those are some tools that can also be used to trigger a deployment. Um, eventually, they then call Git. For local developers, a lot of people still use things like MAP and Dev Desktop. Or if you're a, a, a Linux developer, maybe even on Mac or Windows, maybe you're setting up a virtual box VM for every uh, project locally. These are what I see in the market these days a lot. Um, then you get, of course, the, the, the usual suspects for online tools that help you with this Antheon, uh, Antheon, <laughs> Aquia Antheon platform station. <laughs> Did I just predict the future? <laughs> And then for data, you've got an interesting set of uh, maybe not so good tools that we all have, like MySQL import, MySQL dump, MySQL import, some um, cloudy tools that bring certain uh, advantages and disadvantages, like um, Elastic um, uh, EBS volume snapshots, so <coughs> Elastic block storage, sorry, I don't remember what that stood for. Um, maybe you're using cool techniques like LVM or DRBD, which will give you um, the, the holy grail of, of, of data moving uh, and data storage, which is uh, called copy on write. That's what Dropbox does. Did you know that when you upload a file to Dropbox and then you share it with your friend, they don't make another copy of that file for your friend, but they charge them for it? <laughs> Good business model, right? That's copy on write for you. So, um, so those, sorry, those are the tools now. I can put again. Let's push the wrong button. But you really wanted to see this slide. This was really, I, I could tell it was a gripper. Okay. So, in the goal to make your OCD deployment consistent across the different environments that you've got, where do you think the weak link is? It's on the slide, it's, it's local. The hardest place where you're going to spend the most time getting it right and where you're going to have the fewest <coughs> guarantees of consistency right now are on your developer's local machines. So let me describe a situation and you can raise your hand if this more or less approximates how you either do things now or have done things at a company in your past. Okay, we've got some development and staging and testing servers, those are set up by the system, and we've got a production hoster, they're really great, they give us all sorts of guarantees, charge us a lot of money, we trust them. But for the developers, whether you're on Windows, Mac, Linux, or whatever, we just let you set up whatever you want because, you know, developers should have free choice of the tools they have. You know, we just trust your developers to be able to set up. How many, how many people work in companies where you prescribe a development environment for local? Anybody? Okay, not so many, but a couple. Um, this is a hidden cost. It's a hidden cost in many ways. First of all, it's actually pretty hard to set up all of those things on development. Uh, second of all, you're going to have a very high degree of inconsistency 
amongst your developers in terms of how they're doing things, and this can lead to all sorts of problems. And um, they're also taking just an enormous amount of time fiddling with that stuff that you're not aware of that is having a material influence on your burndown chart that you're just not aware of as a project manager or a business owner because you don't see it, they don't report it, and you don't talk about it in Scrum. What you do today? Oh, I installed Apache. You never hear that. Nobody, no developer uh, who's doing Drupal development, this like very high end type of uh, stuff, you know, lots of money, and very high salaries. You can never say, oh, I spent three hours you know, configuring Apache on my local environment. You wouldn't hear that. But it happens. Um, and, you know, you've got tools that I mentioned, like MAMP or that desktop that you know help you a little bit along the way. But what about all those modern tools? You know, what about the flexibility that we're seeing in web application development? You know, with Symfony talking to Drupal, Drupal talking to Symfony, um, Laravel being cool, people wanting to modularize, use APIs, use the right tool for the right thing. Uh, what are you going to do when you need Redis and MCache, Node.js, MongoDB, maybe you've got a PostgreSQL database because your product management uh, catalog or your product catalog requires it? Those are all things that those developers are going to have to go and inconsistently set up on their local machine again, and they're not going to tell you about it on Scrum again because that's just kind of taken for granted. So in my mind, this is a very inconsistent way to do it, uh, and it really highlights the biggest problem that the this part of the industry is facing right now, and that is having a consistent deployment mechanism for local machines. Um, for consistent deployments, again, the data is a problem. 98% of the time, the data comes from production and gets brought down into development environments, test environments, so that you can test on the live production data. Sometimes you replace production data with test data because you've been staging, pre preparing something that just completely blows away everything that you've got online, but that's really rare. And again, data equals the SQL, the uploaded files, the solar index, anything else that's permanent storage. And with data, you have the unique <coughs> problem that size starts to really matter. So when is data big data for Drupal? Uh, is it you know a one gigabyte database, 10 gigabyte database? You know, if you have a terabyte of data, is that big data? Well, I think it's all relative to what you have to do with it. If you have to MySQL dump a five gigabyte database, well, three hours, three, four hours, right? That's the export. Now we have to import it. Three, four, five hours, right? Um, if it's 100 gigabytes of files, what are you going to do? Rsync, probably SCP, maybe. That's dependent on your network connection. Um, that's really slow, that's another three, four hours. Uh, then if you want that solar index to be there so that you can see your um, red ladies high heel pump shoes and menu item because they're on sale this week, and that's what your stakeholder is looking for, uh, is the sale on those shoes on the test environment, then you have to index solar too. I'll see you next week because that's gonna take all week to set up. Uh, I don't care how much Jenkins you do. Um, that takes a long time. Plus, if you are doing anything with sensitive data that has to be sanitized so that you're not distributing and disseminating sensitive customer data across the entire local feature one sprint dev UAT testing um, production workflow. So, okay, big problem actually. It's, um, this is a real cost for most of the companies that I've ever seen doing Drupal development in any way. What do you do? So, um, I don't tell you what you do until the end, so you have to wait. <laughs> Um, the other part, because remember, this is a framework for evaluating deployment uh, technologies more than a solution to all of your deployment problems. So the next part of the framework that I want you to consider when looking at deployment uh, is, is it deterministic? Deterministic means for every event there exists conditions that could cause no other event. Okay, one more time. For every event there exists conditions that could cause no other event. Reduced into Drupal speak, that means you've got something that you're going to deploy and it can only result in one thing in the end. There is no other way that it can be deployed. It will exactly deploy one thing. That's deterministic. And it's highly unlikely that many of us do deterministic deployment at this point. But this is why I want you to evaluate what you're doing with this lens and ask yourself, how deterministic is it? So the goal, in my opinion, 
is for any given Git repository, if you take a hash of that Git repository, exactly the same application should result from your deployment every time it is pushed, no matter to what environment you're pushing it to, whether it's local, dev stage, product, production, whatever. For every Git repository, as a hash, it should result in exactly the same application being deployed, including all of the infrastructure, including all of the data, including all of the network services, everything. You need to have that before you can have the confidence that I want you to have in your deployment. So, uh, you have uh, an interesting thing happening in PHP world and in web application world that we're using more and more tools to build our application for us. In, as We used to just dump all of the code in one directory and say, hey, that's my application. These days, we have a tendency to do things like use Rush Make or have a composer JSON file or maybe uh, use tools like npm pip or get some Ruby gems to get some other dependencies and that's all part of a build process for the application that we're working on. Uh, how many people have seen code like this in your daily routine? Yeah? Okay, or maybe less, uh, right? So we have situations now where you can't just write CSS anymore, you have to actually compile your CSS. You know, the reason I moved from Java development into PHP development is because I hated compiling stuff. I just wanted to be able to change code, hit refresh, and see it, right? But we're moving away from that for reasons that are well known and well discussed in all sorts of ways, and in, in the most uh, innocuous of the corners of the web application, the CSS. So there are all sorts of steps, um, building dependencies, compiling assets, preparing things for a deployment that all need to be orchestrated, they need to be done in a consistent way, and the deterministic aspect of that is that they need to come out on the other side exactly the same every time you deploy, or you don't have any confidence in what you're doing. So that's the deterministic aspect. Uh, when it comes to infrastructure, there's some obvious points about this deterministic uh, idea. It's obvious, hopefully, that you should use the same services on every step of, and the same configuration on every step of your deployment. So you want your dev server to have the same version of PHP and MySQL as your production server. And that's hopefully obvious, and um, you can find many services uh, or tools that will guarantee that for you. A less obvious uh, aspect of the deterministic deployment, however, is that your deployment should not only be repeatable, it should be reversible. So if you go back to the idea that I had that if you took the, the hash of your Git repository and that would describe an application that you're deploying, then you quickly easily understand that with that and a known state of the data, you would be able to revert a deployment to exactly uh, the application that you had before you did whatever you did that made you want to revert, like the people watching their ships. So uh, the, determ the deterministic aspect, the benefit of that is that you get a repeatable and reversible deployment. Okay, back to the data. What are some of the problems you get with data, and why is a deterministic data deployment important to you? Okay, I, mean, I need to. I think I need to take a little extra effort to impress upon you that you should care about this problem. Otherwise, it's you know like you know global warming on the moon. Who cares, right? It's not my problem, but it actually is your problem. With the Drupal site, you've got two, maybe three main repositories of data that I've already mentioned. And the deterministic state of that data is quite important to your application for the testing purposes. So you've got a database, okay? Actually, everything's stored in the database Drupal. Well, it kind of is, uh, but it's not really. So what is stored in the database in terms of like uploaded files, and images, and PDFs, and Word documents that you've uploaded is a reference to them. So that's already a linkage between the database and the uploaded files. This is an important linkage to respect and to maintain and to take care of. If you import a database that thinks it has files on the file system that aren't there, then you'll have big empty boxes in your website or even worse things will happen. If you import a database that is older than the file system that you have, then you've got orphaned files uploaded on your file system that the database doesn't know about and you'll never find them. If you have a database that is made at a different state than your solar index, 
then you're going to have a situation where you've got content on the site that you can't find. It won't be in the uh, menus, it won't be in the facets, and you can't find it in the search, but it's there. And you'll have somebody complain, hey, I wrote that article. Why, why can't I find it on the site? So there's this um, temporal linkage between the consistent state of your database and your solar index, your database and your uploaded files that has to be respected in your deployments. This is really important on production. It's also really important on your testing servers because you don't want your automated tests to fail because the solar index is out of sync or because the file is missing. And you don't want your customers to see those problems either because your customers don't have a concept of, oh, just ignore that thing that looks glaringly wrong in the website right now because when I launch it, I know it's going to be fine. That's really not a good way to deal with your customers and give them the assurance that they're, they're not about to experience what happened on the docs, right? So the deterministic properties of your data management across all of your environments is actually very important. Okay, with OCD deployment, you use actual production data, including solar indexes and uploaded files for every branch that you deploy and test, including your local branch, which means you have to solve a huge problem, two huge problems. You have to be able to take that data in a consistent state at one moment in time, which if you think about the five gigabyte database problem and the 100 gigabytes of uploaded files is difficult simply for the matter of transferring over the wire. And you need to be able to do that for uh, every environment. So it's a big challenge. I'm not going to pretend this is going to be an easy goal to achieve. On the other side, an OCD deployment is not a MySQL dump, MySQL import. That won't do it. It's not our syncing files, and it's not re-indexing solar every time you deploy. If those are part of your deployment strategy, even if Jenkins is doing it for you, it's, it doesn't pass the OCD test. So, deterministic. When a developer initiates deployment, there is only one possible outcome because that's the only way it can be. That's the goal. And I think we can get there. Okay, so now I'm about to go into um, a, uh, an example. Okay, I, I did promise you examples from platform.sh. And I'm going to explain how far this tool gets towards providing those qualities. Um, the video actually has some extra stuff in it, so I'm going to let it roll. Um, I think it's rolling. Yes. So just sit tight until we get to the, to the interesting point. But by the end of this video, you will have seen six different deployments that have most, if not all, of the properties that I've just described. Okay, so, but first we have to do a little bit of setup. We have to get Drupal set up. So Drupal's being built, and Drupal's going to have PHP, MySQL, <coughs> Solar, Redis. And we're going to very quickly, and I mean really quickly, install Drupal 8. We've <coughs> never Drupal, seen Drupal 8 being installed that quick. I mean, like, watch this. <laughs> Boom. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there you go, Drupal 8, beautiful, right? So now we've got a Drupal 8, that means we've got some data, we've got some files, we've got a, hopefully a solar index. Now we're going to do some, some deployments. Okay, the first deployment that we're going to do is going to be a staging branch. Okay, and then we're going to make uh, a few more because you know staging is where you want your customers to look at things and test stuff. Um, that took about a minute for five gigabytes worth of data. Uh, now we're going to make um, other branches, like to say we're doing Sprint, okay? So I'm going to give my Scrum Master the permission to sign that Sprint so that the developers can come in and then they can make a slideshow feature branch or a performance testing feature branch or um, the theme fixes. And now we've done one, two, three, four, five deployments on this each time with a new orchestration of a consistent set of data and services and we've got the permissions needed for people to go in and start working on that on the different branches that they've got. So per branch, I can give Alice, Bob, or Joe um, different permissions so that you know, they can do what they have to do. Okay? In the system, a reader can um, see the branch and they can branch the branch and then they own the branch and a contributor can actually push the branch. Now remember, the consistent part of the deployment is that you always use the same tool, so git push. So to show you git push, I have to go down to the local development in 
uh, experience. I'm going to check out the theme fix branch. It's building the, um, the local version of that in a not perfectly OCD way. Um, and this, once again, is the weak link in the entire tool chain because uh, the local development environment is the hardest to take control of. But I'm going to change some code. I'm going to add a new theme. And I'm going to use my consistent deployment methodology to push that to an environment. And it's going to build in an OCD way. Meaning for the hash of this Git repository now, I can have confidence that as I move this through different uh, environments, the same infrastructure with the copies of the same data and everything is going to build exactly the same way. And this is deployment number six that I'm showing you. So that I've just pushed that onto the theme fixed branch. I'm deploying a new theme. Uh, all the developers see it in real time, so this communication. And when it's done, I can go see my site, and you can see the amazing um, change that it has on my Drupal site when I enable this theme. And everybody can go, ooh, ah, right now. Ooh, ah. Ah, see, beautiful, right? Drupal 8. There you go, Google, Drupal 8. So anyway, you saw six deployments in reality that would have taken up to 10 to 15 minutes, um, minus the you know, human typing time. Uh, and that means uh, consistent integral copies of a five gigabyte volume of data, including a solar index and a MySQL server uh, with the database and the uploaded files, copied and replicated byte-wise six times so that you don't have to do MySQL uh, export, MySQL import, so that you don't have to do a remixing of your solar, and so that you know that everything's tied together in the right, right way with exact copies of all of the running services. So that, to me, actually satisfies a lot of the qualities of OCD deployment that I think we should all be looking for. And there are other ways to get this. I just use platform as my product as the example, but I'm going to show you some other ways to get the same types of guarantees if you want to do it yourself or use other service providers. OK, so in summary, the benefits of OCD are you get simplicity on the execution. You get a testable, repeatable, and reversible process that will save you time, even the hidden costs of the local development that you're probably not measuring very accurately in your, um, in, in your organization, I'm just guessing accusing you, <laughs> not trying to accuse you, but uh, it's really hard to measure how much time your developers are spending setting up their infrastructure. Uh, and you get the confidence for every time you do something, every time you push code to your repository, you get the confidence of knowing that you've just executed an entire deployment of the entire application, which is exactly what you're going to do when you go live with it, so that by the time you get to the production environment, you've done exactly the same thing 20, 30, 40, 50 times, and you have a lot of confidence that you've seen everything that can possibly go wrong in that situation. Those are the benefits. So how do you do it? If you don't want to use Platform SH, you can do it yourself. Okay. Uh, one of the great buzzwords uh, in modern times is Docker. Um, and this is their very cute logo. I like it a lot. I wish I had I wish this were my marketing. I wish I owned a Docker company. I, I'm quite fond of it, and I think it's great technology. Um, if you do it with Docker, um, you know, Docker and Ansible, uh, you know, a lot of times I'm on a call, what do you do for your deployment? Oh, we're, you know, we're building something with Docker and Ansible. That's going to give you a long way in terms of making a consistent approach to um, the orchestration of your infrastructure. It doesn't do a great job at this moment of solving the data problem. Okay, the data problem is really hard. So if you spin up something new with Docker, you're going to have a hard time easily getting within 30 seconds a copy of your 5 to 10 gigabyte data stores in a consistent state where you can instantly start working on them, but know that it's everything that you have in production exactly the way it is in that moment, all tied together uh, the right way. Uh, there's a whole cloud world called Cloud Foundry. If you're not familiar with it, you can probably spend the rest of your life learning it. And it's huge, and it does almost everything that I just showed you. Um, in some way or another, if, if you want to learn to use it. There are also commercial services um, behind it, so you can use that. Uh, we've got our friends uh, in California uh, who are writing what's called the Calibox. The agency's called Calamuna. They're using uh, Docker at the core. It's a very interesting initiative. I checked that out if you want to get something close to OCD deployment. 
Um, they're probably doing more than anybody else right now to solve the local development problem. Um, so definitely something I'm following with great interest. Um, quite a fan of their approach. Something that you want to check out as well. And then of course, if you're going to do any of this yourself, you're going to really want to master either Puppet Chef or Salt Stack and or Ansible, they kind of fit into the same world in different various ways. These are all tools that can do the orchestration part of, of, of your OCD deployment in a more or less deterministic way. Um, so, and they give you the consistency one tool to turn to for all of that. So, there are ways to do this. Um, again, the weak link is the local, um, the local uh, environment. And if you do it right, then you will consistently, over and over and over again, have the thrilling experience of building something that's big, that's meaningful, that's important, and having an epic launch every time where nothing goes wrong. So, you know, what a feeling it must be to like launch something that, you know, <laughs> weighs as much as a city block. It's great, right? And in, 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 a, in a lot of ways, uh, the big projects that we do in this room resemble something uh, along that order of magnitude of complexity and scale um, in a virtual way. Okay, so thank you. That was my presentation. Um, if you want to try platform.sh with a voucher coupon to try it for free, take a picture of the screen right now, or simply memorize 2015-DC London and uh, apply that coupon code when you sign up for platform.sh. And I'd now like to ask if anybody has any questions. Um, can you just describe how uh, you integrated uh, SMG to a platform as an example of what point it would be So the question is um, specifically for platform.sh. How is continu con continuous integration achieved? What, at what point in the process do you do testing? So there are a couple of answers to that. First of all, um, there's an entire API that any continuous integration tool can call into. Uh, like a Jenkins can um, get callbacks and call into the platform when environments are built to trigger a testing procedure coming in from the outside. There are also build and deploy hooks, which can uh, trigger um, code-based unit testing or you know, launch processes that are actually on the environment, like you can uh, trigger simple tests or keep unit tests uh, on, in the build process or in the deployment process. So there are a couple ways to do it. And that's actually a really good question to ask yourself in your OC deployment is, where does the continuous integration fit in? Where does the testing happen? I didn't talk about that at all in the presentation, but it's obviously part of the recipe for your deployment procedure that you need to answer. Yes, sir. Um, is there any way of docking any of this pieces, or is it all the same thing? I mean, I've I, I often made projects, and um, they've already got a lot of infrastructure already set up, um, and I tend to see that um, certain clients they adopt some bits of it, um, but it often seems like more of a hassle as well. On the market, yeah, the question is how, how could I adopt some or all of what was just shown in a piecemeal way? So, um, first of all, specific to my product, you can use it just for development and deploy to anything that you want to, although I think that it obviates a lot of the advantage because it's OCD up until the most important set. <laughs> Would you use it, is that way around, you use it for development and then deploy some, can you use it for the deployment phase and then do development? Yes, you can also use our platform as a pure deployment infrastructure, which is actually a little bit more logical in the world of things because then you at least know what parts you have responsibility for and we take responsibility for the, you know, showtime, right? So that's also possible. And I think that like all of the providers out there that are commercially in the same space will give you the same types of options. But for piecemeal, you really quickly end up with a lot on your plate in terms of do-it-yourself. And it becomes really hard to actually achieve OCD, in my opinion. So this is not a totally solved problem. Um, like I said, what we have doesn't totally solve it. We're working towards the aspirational goal that I am putting forward to you today, but it's really hard to find a solution to this problem right now. Any other questions? Uh, yes. <coughs> 
conversation between the solar servers? So what platform.sh does is it actually makes, you remember the Dropbox example? <laughs> Copy on right. It makes it so that um, when you create a new environment, um, we have a copy and write version of everything, including the solar index, so that in that exact moment when you have a new branch, you have, still only have one copy of your data, but as soon as anything changes on that, then it starts writing new versions of it. So um, you actually have your entire solar index available to you from the get-go when, when you do a branch. And we, we can actually do that uh, across distributed file systems. So when we have solved the OCD problem, it means that we'll be considering your local virtual machine and your data store there as part of the distributed file system. So you'll actually get the copy of unwrite data from, from the cloud, which is really cool. Other questions? Yes? Cool stuff like LVM, DRBD, and the Ceph file system. Plus these files in the middle. Yeah, it's 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 the the conceptual idea is that you've got a file system that's distributed over many volumes on any <coughs> number of hosts, and the data can be in, in in redundant copies, of course, across all of them. And then when you create a new branch it, and orchestrate a new environment, it simply uses that data store until you write something that's unique to that branch and change the data, and then it piecemeal starts putting new copies of the data as you write new data, so that incrementally, through an entire hierarchy even, you're simply creating the new parts of the data store that you're writing to. So Google, yeah, exactly. Google for copy on write. Richard? Um, so platform um, is not specifically a Drupal tool. It's a web application tool in general. Uh, and we very much focus on Symfony and WordPress and Drupal and even things like commerce that is focused on even, right? You can host all of that. So what we have is a standardized place where you can tell the application to do its sanitization. So the obvious thing to do in a Drupal application is on the deploy hook, when you've orchestrated your application, you've got the data store in place, you've got the running servers in place, then you have a chance as a deploy hook to do some stuff like drush commands, because you have the entire application in place, and then you can do drush sanitize. What is it, David, what's the command sanitize? SQL. SQL sanitize. So that's one standard way to do it. And then if you need to um, expand on that, then I, I would write a script and call that, right? And then you, can, then you would have it standardized across all of the environments. Um, and then you need to set a variable to make sure that it doesn't happen when you go into production. So you don't sanitize your production data as you go into production. <laughs> that, that would be akin to the first video I showed. <laughs> That's why you also want backups. <laughs> Other questions? I'll talk one more if there's any. Okay, well then, have a good Sunday um, afternoon, and thank you for coming, and enjoy the weekend one. Thank you. <laughs>